So this is a 58-year-old female who's incidentally noted to have an elevated lymphocyte count, um, and a diagnosis of chronic lymphocytic leukemia was made uh, based on the typical markers that we look for and assess uh, for that diagnosis. Um, so the markers that we look for are CD5, CD19, and CD23. And it's the presence of all of those on the surface of the cells and restriction with regard to the light chain, either kappa or lambda, that makes the diagnosis of CLL. She was asymptomatic at the time that she was diagnosed and was noted also to have an elevated white blood cell count and to not have any significant anemia or thrombocytopenia. And because of this, because she was asymptomatic and because she had relatively normal blood counts and um, she had no indications for treatment initially and was uh, monitored. Uh, this patient did also have a bone marrow, which isn't essential for the diagnosis of CLL. We're doing less and less, fewer and fewer bone marrows these days. Uh, bone marrows are more helpful these days in terms of response assessment, um, and particularly are done on clinical trials where we're um, clarifying whether or not patients are in complete remission or in partial remission. Um, and in terms of other features that were assessed, um, those features don't necessarily need to be characterized upon initial diagnosis because we don't change management based on those results. So one of which is the FISH test. So this patient had FISH done um, when they were initially assessed um, and were noted to have a 17P deletion and trisomy 12. Um, now the 17P deletion is a high risk feature um, and that's something that gets our attention. It's something that we use to determine how to manage patients and how to um, follow them in the clinic. Um, it's not necessarily useful, though, in terms of determining when to start treatment. Uh, so it isn't an essential test to do when patients are newly diagnosed, but certainly FISH needs to be done if you have a patient who needs treatment. The other feature is their, uh, her mutation status. So she had her immunoglobulin heavy chain V-gene mutation status assessed, and she was noted to have an unmutated V-gene, which is uh, also a higher risk feature. Those patients may be managed differently depending on what treatment we're talking about. So also, like FISH, that isn't an essential test to do when patients are diagnosed, but is very helpful when you're determining treatment and how to manage uh, patients. Uh, the beta-2 microglobulin was evaluated in this patient. That's been an easy test to do that's prognostic. A higher beta-2 microglobulin is generally correlated with a more active disease and has been correlated with shorter time to first treatment. So overall, this patient, although when she initially presented, did not have any indications for treatment, did have some high-risk features um, and would be a patient that I would monitor r relatively closely. Um, to determine whether or not she needs to be treated. She should not be treated initially based just on the fact that she has a 17P deletion because we know from our own data that there are about a third of the patients with 17P deletion don't have active progressive disease and don't need treatment for sometimes several years. So you may be doing a disservice to this patient by treating early just based on the 17P deletion. So she's a young patient, which is unusual. Usually patients um, who have CLL diagnosed are over 70, and they don't need treatment usually until sometime after their diagnosis. They don't usually need initial treatment. So most patients will have some period of observation. And this patient had a period of observation of about two years and then had active progressive indications of active progressive disease by virtue of having developed fatigue and night sweats. And those were the indications for treatment for this patient. The other test that wasn't done on this patient that we would be interested in obtaining is the TP53 mutation status. So that also is prognostic. Uh, it's very common for patients who have a 17P deletion to also have a mutated TP53. Um, and so we like to know that information. Also, there are patients who don't have 17P who do have TP53 mutation, those patients would be managed differently. So that is an important test to obtain if you have access to, to that test. Patients who have a 17P deletion or mutated TP53 lack P53 function, 
And the importance of that is that they don't do well with chemotherapy. Chemotherapy doesn't work for those patients. So we have other treatments that have been identified that are clearly active in managing those patients, one of which is a BTK inhibitor, uh, particularly a brutitib in this case, which was the treatment that this patient got. Um, and that's really the only drug right now that's available in untreated patients who have 17P as their first treatment. Uh, the other drugs that are active to treat patients with 17P deletion, uh, while they're approved, they're approved for previously treated patients. Uh, one of them is venetoclax, which we'll talk about. The other is idelalisib. Um, but for this patient with the 17P deletion, um, having that feature, the standard treatment and best treatment for that patient is ibrutinib uh, or a BTK inhibitor. Um, and that patient would be not appropriate for treatment with chemotherapy or chemoimmunotherapy.